Read it and follow with me as we read chapter 14. Follow after charity, and we know that that is the Greek agape, the love, a love that is willing to be set aside so that another can be elevated uh, in the same picture as Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ was willing to have His flesh and His deity set aside for a little while so that all humanity could be elevated in their relationship with God. And that's the love that we're to have for one another. But follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understand him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesied edifieth the church. I would, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret and that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, and sh what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in sound, how shall it be known what is pipe or harp? For if the trumpet gave uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for that battle? So likewise ye accept, except ye utter by the tongue the words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak, for ye shall speak to the air, or there are voices, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, speak that ye may excel to the edifying, see that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, and giving of thanks? seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For if thou verily givest thanks well, but the other if the, is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my voice, with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Basically, saying, be, don't be immature. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they, for all that will they not hear me. For all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believeth not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together in one place, and all speak with tongue, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they say, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. 
How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, a doctrine, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be two or three, or at the most, let it be two, or at the most, by three, and that by force, one let and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Now notice there. Well, let the prophet speak two or three, and let others judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, for all ye may for ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, and is in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, all, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them be let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in church. What came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, covet to prophecy. And forbid not to speak with the tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. May God add the reading to his scriptures. Now as you can tell, it's going to get really good, right? That's why people ask, was I even going to teach this part? Or was I just going to jump over it? I'm going to teach it. And what we've got to remember is some things are cultural. And other things are the doctrine of the church. Just like in the Old Testament with the Jews. You know, they ask us, why can we be so strong against homosexuality? But yet, we don't offer sacrifices anymore, do we? And we eat all the pork we want to eat, right? Reason being is because in the Old Testament, there are three different types of law. You've got the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. No matter what times change, whatever happens, the moral laws of God will not change. What is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. And you do not see that change in the New Testament anyway, anyhow, whatever. What was wrong in the Old Testament is still wrong in the New Testament. Amen? But then you've got, then you've got ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws are things like this. You don't eat of the pork or the split hood or the the animals that have shells and or, or they don't have scales or whatever. See those were ceremonial you remember because God said they were unclean. They were a representative of a dirty state, of a dirty world. Remember the priest? What did they do? They cut blood and oil on top of him and different things like that. Do they still do that in the Jewish circles? No, why? Because it was ceremonial. Just like in the book of Hebrews, it talks about how when we talk about the temple in the Old Testament and we talk about the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, how it was a picture of the spiritual, meaning that it was a reference to the thing. That's what the ceremonial law was about. It was a picture of the things to come. It was a picture of what it was going to be. It was a physical, tangible uh, picture of what we are in the spiritual form now on the new covenant. The old covenant. Alright? That's two. Moral, ceremony, and then what did you have? Well, praise God, the Jews, what were they? Were they just some little tribe out in the middle of nowhere? No, they were a nation. They had a king. So you know what else kind of law you had? National law. Their laws. That was their laws as Jews. As a country. And all of it, and, and when God gave these laws and when He laid these out, He was starting them as a new country. He was laying out the Old Testament covenant, and He was also at the same time giving moral laws that would never change. And we have to be wise enough and have to have enough discernment to know what is what, what is uh, 
uh, still moral law and what is it with ceremonial law and what it was that has also been given to the nation of Israel. Does that make sense? See, when you talk to somebody about that, they don't want to hear that. They just want to have a good excuse. And see, the same is true now as we begin to look at 1 Corinthians. Now, what we see in here is we see some truths about the gifts, but we also see some customs there that, uh, just like with the shaving of the bald heads and different things like that, prostitutes don't shave their heads no more in America. So if you told somebody to shave their head, uh, it wouldn't make any sense to the people, right? So see, some of it is culture, but a lot of it is what we deal with. And tonight, as we begin to move into talking about the gifts of the tongue specifically, I want to remind you that Paul has already spent two chapters talking about the gifts, but he has not focused on the gifts whatsoever really specifically. Why? Because he wanted to prepare them. He did not want them to be ignorant, and before he got down to the nuts and bolts of it, he wanted them to recognize what was the most important things about the gifts. In, in uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the main focus is, I don't want you to have a lack of understanding or to misunderstand the purpose and the use of the gifts of the Spirit. He says, I've seen you, you've been carried away in your worldly customs and in the things that you had when you worshipped false idols and you got overwhelmed in them. And if you're not careful with this power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to you and given to your church, if you're not careful, you'll misunderstand it and you'll misuse the gifts that God has given to you. And then in verses 4 through 7, he makes sure, he says, there's different gifts there's different roles for those gifts, and there's different ways to use those gifts. But all of those gifts, no matter how different they are and how wide the use of them, all of them have been given to you by the same God, by the same Lord, and by the same Spirit. And they're profitable. I've given them to you for one distinct purpose, and that is to profit the church. So that the church can be a better church. Not so you can... Hold the gift and hold it over other people's head and say, I'm a better Christian than you because I've got X gift and you've only got Y gift. No, it's so that you together, X and Y, can help make up with Z the last part of the alphabet. So that you can be, make the body what the body's supposed to be. And then if you look in uh, verses 12, 8 through 10, there's a list of gifts. He begins to list out the gifts as he does also again in chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. And yes, the order is uh, necessary. It's specific and it's necessary. And then when we get into, uh, we go on down through the rest of chapter 12, beginning in about verse 11 all the way to about 27, he spends the majority of chapter 12 focusing on the need for the gift, how that individual gift come together to make up the whole body, just like our body part, come together to make up the human body. And it's in the human body that we, which are spiritual beings, are able to function in the world which we live in. And that's what the church is. The church is made up of individual members, and it's in those members that the Spirit lives, and through the Spirit, God functions in this world through the church. I know it's making you think, right? And you don't like to think. <coughs> we don't like to think. That's the best problem. We, if we're going to quit being a shallow pond and be a deep pond, we've got to start thinking. Got to use our mind. And then in chapter 12, verse 31, this is what he said. He says, But come, have a sincere desire for the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent place. So he said, hey, I don't want you to be confused. And there are gifts that are better than other gifts. There's gifts that are more important to the functioning of the church than other gifts as well. And then in chapter 13, the whole focus is a God made love. The whole focus, and he says this, though I speak with the tongues of angels and the tongues of men, if I have not love, I'm in sounding brass and tingling cymbals. Without love, all these gifts are invalid. You can do all this and you can do all that, but without love, you're not profiting the church anything. You're not profiting God or yourself anything. And he goes on and he describes love. And remember we talked about how the uh, uh, most places you hear chapter 13 is at a wedding. But it wasn't written to married folks. It was written to church family. And that we're supposed to have that type of love one to another. 
that matter of fact, that's how what God says in John, verse John, He said, that's how they're going to know you're mine. By the way that you love one another. And then He picks up here in chapter 14, and we're going to go in deeper into this study, but in chapter 14, Paul is going to describe the proper use of the gifts of the Spirit, specifically, as we've already read it, the gift of the tongues. And I want you to notice, and you're going to see this, there are going to be some times it is used and called the gift of the tongues, and other times it's simply going to be called the tongue. And I believe there are two specific different things that are talked about when he talks about these things. Chapters, uh, verses 1 through 5. Notice what it says. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, notice, singular, speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. How be it he in the, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries? But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that it speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesied edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with the tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues. Now that is Paul saying that. Greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with the tongues. Except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now notice, if we start there in verse 1, how does he begin it? Begin it? Begin it? How are you going to begin it? He begins by reinforcing the truth about love. Before he even gets into it again about the tongues and all that, he makes sure it's about agape love. It's about being willing to be set aside so that another brother or another sister could be elevated to a point of blessing and higher uh, position. That in the church and as our individual, as we seek to use our gifts, love's got to be the motivation behind the gift. To see the church being lifted high. For the glory of the Lord. To see a brother or a sister who's been called in a certain area. We need to be willing to be made low. So that they can be made high. So that their gifts may go further. Our gift might be the fact, and we may not like this. We're to be the stool they stand on so that they can be lifted higher. How would you handle that if that was your calling? You would never be heard. You would never be seen. Nobody would ever know your role. Some people don't like that right now. Do it. But that may be the gift. Look what he says. He says after he says, follow after charity, meaning pursue or make sure that love is the number one thing that you're after. But he also says, and desire spiritual gifts. The word desire there means to long for or to set your heart on the spiritual gifts. You know what? We should want more spiritual gifts. We should want to have, because the more spiritual gifts mean the more areas in our life that we can work for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll never forget at the lowest point of my spiritual life. And, and I've been brought up in Baptist church. I've been called Baptist doctrine all my life. But I was sick of it and I knew there had to be more to it than doctrine. There had to be more to it than coming to church on Sunday. I got along with the Lord and before daylight, many, many days in a row, and just prayed to Him and said, God, I want what you have for me. Not what I feel like I want. Not what I feel like other people have told me I need. But I want what you have. And when you get to that point, that's that desire. Your heart is set. Not on what the world tells you. Not on what the church says for you. But what the Spirit of God, the one who saved your soul from hell, what He wants to give you and what He wants you to have in your life. That's what we're to see sincerely desire. Not what we see churches making much of. Not what we see churches uh, uh, lifting up and saying this is important. No. We want what the Spirit of God says is important. So, praise God, if you're here tonight and not sure about the spiritual gift, you're probably in a good place right now. Just have a point where say, God, I want you to give me what I'm supposed to have. Not what I've been taught to have, not what's been beat in my head or drilled into my head by my parents, and then praise God, thank you for parents that tried to raise us up, but I'm going to tell you this, they ain't in, infallible. Only the Spirit of God and the Word of God is. But notice, 
If you'll notice this, as he's getting to it, if you look back in chapter 12, verse 28, he lays out a specific list of the gifts of God. Remember, right there in verse 1, he says, Desire ye the spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy, meaning to utter spirit-filled words. Or spirit-filled, to be able to speak with the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. That's what prophesying is. Not just to foretell or to tell the future, but to foretell. Thus saith the Lord. Maybe it's to look at a brother and say, Hey, in the name of Jesus, I just feel like the Spirit of God has come on me, and I need to let you know that you're going to make it through. I had a woman tell me one time when I was running from the Lord, and I believe this was a gift of prophecy, if there's ever been a gift of prophecy. She looked at me through a teller window at a drive through at a bank and looked me dead in my eyes and said, you're supposed to be pulling them out. That's what she said. I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you. You're to be pulling them out and not letting them pull you back in. That was the gift of prophecy. She didn't know me from Adam. She didn't know the call that was on my life. All she knew was the Spirit was moving her to say something. And so, but notice in verse 28 of chapter 12, but God has set some in the church, meaning He has put people in specific positions. Now, listen how He puts it. First, apostles. Who are the apostles? They are the ones that were called by God that established the church in the Greek of the Gentile world. Without the apostles, there would not be churches outside of the Jewish nation. But they were willing to go out and lay the seeds and the foundation of the churches that have actually spread to America because they were willing to go to different places. They got second. Notice, one. Number two, prophets or prophesying. Those that foretell or foretell God's Word. Those that preach, thus saith the Lord. Those that teach, those that evangelize and different things like that. Under the name of prophets or prophecy, you can put a whole lot of different callings. Preacher, teacher, evangelist, all those different things fall under that because it's someone who has the power of the Spirit on their utterances or on their speaking. Thirdly, teachers. They are one who not only speaks, but what they try to do is dispense understanding. They try to lay it on people so that not only do they hear the word, but they understand how to apply it and lead them in a daily life, different things like that. After that, now notice, he quits using the numerical system now. Because see, we're getting there and we've got the first tier gifts. Meaning, the ones that to have a church, you have got to have these things. You've got to have a pastor. You've got to have teachers. You've got to have those that are willing to stand up and lead the Word of God. The next one is the gift of miracles. Then, the gifts of hell. Governments, diversities of tongues. Now notice, all those last four, they're just grouped together. You've got the first tier gifts. And then you've got the second tier gifts. The first tier gifts are the ones that the church, that help establish and start a functioning church, you basically need those. And then you get to miracles, then gifts, and thank, praise God if you've got them, it helps your church be a more full church. It helps it be a more a church that's able to reach further out. But you can still have a church without having these. Remember, the order here is, impor is important as to which is necessary within the body of Christ. And when he says to long and to hunger after gifts, he says prophecy. Not me, not some denomination, but the writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says we should pray that God give us the ability to have the power of the Holy Spirit on the words that come out of our mouth. Amen. Now what are we praying? What are we taught to pray for? What gifts are the ones that we're told? And it could be singing. It may even be singing. But we're taught, it's what we're taught to pray for, especially, and this is where Baptists have pulled themselves away from other denominations. And can I say this? That denominations is a tool of the devil because ever since you've seen more denominations, you've seen less and less unity with inside the church universal. Man. It's a tool of Satan. But that's why we separate because we, we differ in this understanding. But we need to be able to prophesy, to have it, to speak inspired words. <coughs> this includes the first list over in chapter 12, verse 8. If you'll notice there, what's the first one he says? For to one is given the Spirit, by the Spirit, what? Word of wisdom. See, they're not in different orders. What is the number one gift? Utterances of wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the number one. Seek ye the most, the, what 
says in verse 31 of chapter 12, but covet earnestly the best gifts. The best gifts. Romans, words of wisdom in there in 12, 28, apostles, prophets, and teachers. Listen to what it says over in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And it is written, How beautiful are the pre feet of them that preach the gospel of priests, bringing tidings, bringing glad tidings of good things. Hey, we have the Word of God right now, and the Word of God is written. That's why we believe in the Gideons. But do you understand that it is through prophecy or words of spiritual power that is the main spreader of the gospel seed? By word of mouth. More people are saved by a brother or sister in God. Tell them, I've been praying for you. You know Jesus loves you. Then there ever will be some of standing behind the pulpit and then coming to Jesus through that. And then in verse 2 of chapter 14. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now you look there, and if you have the King James Version, which is the best version, if you have it tonight, the word unknown there is in italics, right? That means that it has been added for our clarification. It was not in the original Greek. But based on the interpretation of the Greek, they put the idea of unknown to their wife. Because what it's saying there is that it may not be a human language. It may not be a human language. You're looking at the ground and saying, what? I'm telling you. When you see the word tongue without the S on it, it's usually leading to the idea of an unknown tongue or an unknown language. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not to who? Not to men, but to who? God. To God. For no man understandeth, howbeit the Spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Note the singular. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Not a human language. Go back to 13 1. What did he say? Though I speak with the tongues of men and who? Angels. Angels. Notice there. He's specifically saying that. Hey, men have a language, but it also seems, based on our study, not on what Brian's saying, right? But based on the study of God's Word, that there are tongues which angels, there's a language that angels speak that we don't speak and we do not know. Amen? You say, Brian, I didn't get that. That wasn't a very powerful amen. So I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. What if we have the wrong chapter here? No, I'll be done known to do something like that though. Second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth, but such a one was caught up into the third heaven. Now, here's the first question, where's the third heaven? Well, we have our heavens, right? We have the blue sky that we see every day. I believe that's the first heaven. What's the second heaven? It's what's past the blue sky. That's our realm. Where the stars and the planets and all that, that's the second heaven. And then there is the third heaven. The heaven that is not seen with the eyes of man. It is the place where the Son of God and the Heavenly Father abide until the day that we are joined together with them. That will be the third heaven. Does that make sense? Okay. Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. Now listen. How that he was caught up into paradise. Paradise there being, meaning heaven. You look up the word, I'll preach it at Cornerstone. I can preach it here if I need to. But, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will not glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my affirmity. Now say, this is what he said. He said, I know a man. I believe it was Paul, and I believe he was saying this because he didn't want them to place him on a pedestal, sister. But that he went there, and there was a language there that we as men cannot speak with our own mouths. 
That's what the scripture says, right? You're thinking this, Brian, you are really making us think too much tonight. Yeah, but we want to understand what we say we believe. Yeah. We just don't want to say we believe it when our brothers and sisters come to us and they believe this. Well, we don't believe it. We're just, by golly. We'll be able to sit down and reason together. With you. So we see that there's a language there that the Bible admits in 2 Corinthians, we know that there's a, in the heavenly realm, there's a, there's a realm where no one is not lawful nor were, is it able for us to speak. And it says here in verse 2 of chapter 14 that a man can speak in such a language that he can only speak to God. It's a language that he is able to speak to God in, but the language that he speaks in, no man understands it. How be it in the spirit he speaketh Mysteries, meaning that there are hidden secrets as he is speaking. <coughs> so here I believe we see a language mentioned that is not one of a human dialect. But this is not the language that is mentioned over in the book of Acts chapter 1 on the day of Pentecost. It's not that language. See, what happened on the day of Pentecost was not an unknown tongue. Matter of fact, it was the tongues with an S on it. It became plural. Listen, over in Acts chapter 2, verses 4 and 6 through 8. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with unknown tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterances. In verse 6 it says this, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, listening, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which we speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we are born? They're speaking in their native language, but we're hearing in our language. There's a miracle that's happening there where the tongues is happening with the plural S. They are speaking that God is taking and allowing them to have the ability to hear. Do you see the two differences? Or are you saying, Brian, you're crazy right now? Huh? You think I'm crazy? I know that. But I'm trying to show you what the Word of God says about this. Not what I say. That's why I believe there can be such a thing as a prayer language. Because, see, that's between you and God in the prayer closet where you are benefited from. Not another man. And you're going to bring that language into the church. You're not going to try to do it. And let me tell you something else. You ain't going to control that language because it's the Spirit that does it and not you. And ain't nobody going to have to teach you that. But that is something that's given to you by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is the gift of heavenly tongue to pray between you and God. I don't even believe you know what you say. It's when you moan and groan in the Spirit. Oh, y'all won't keep me out of church now. I know that. That's what you're going to do. You ain't no Baptist. I am a Baptist. I'm a Baptist who studies the Word of God. And I don't want to go on it because that's what other Baptists said. I want to do it because that's what the Bible study tells me. Right. And that happens again over at Cornelius' house. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 47. Again, I do not believe when we read this that we are talking about an unknown tongue. I believe that we see men speaking in their language and others hearing it in their language as evidence to the power of the Spirit of God that has come to the new started church. Acts chapter 10, 44. Peter, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed. Now listen, they was the circumcision, meaning there were Jews there that already believed, right? They of the circumcision which were believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as who? As well as we. The same God who on the day of Pentecost allowed the Holy Ghost to rush on us and we heard a, 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 our own tongue, our own language come off another man's tongue. Now we, who are of the circumcision or of Jews, we are now talking to those of an Italian band. They were Italians, but the Jews were understood, the Israelis were understood in the Italians. Yeah. Try, try. Yeah. Come on, get with me now. Try. Yeah. Man. You learning something 
the night. Your wheels is a burning and cogs is turning. It ain't turned in a long time. It happens one more time. If you look at Acts chapter 19, verses 2 through 6, this is with Paul. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any. What are you talking about, the Holy Ghost? And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John the Baptist. Then, then said Paul, John very baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Jesus, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. You see? Specifically, two different types of languages here. A heavenly language, tongue, that man cannot understand. Right? That only God can understand. Matter of fact, if the man speaks in that, he himself is blessed, but nobody else is. That's what it says. Right? right? But then we see that there's another type of language that's there, a speaking in the tongue that other people can understand, and they were blessed by it. They were astounded by it. You see what I'm talking about? No mention of the unknown tongue. And notice in the text that this language is for the believer to speak with God. It fits in totally with the idea of a prayer language. With this language, reading there in verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. With this language, men listening cannot understand it, that which is uttered is a hidden secret or something that is not, that's yet to be revealed to us. All right, let's jump down to verse 3. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and to comfort. All right, prophesy or uttering utterances that are spirit-filled. That's what the definition that is. Those gifts. Those with this gift that are able to utter inspired words, they are able to edify or are able to build up a brother and sister or to build up the church. They are able to encourage. The word exhortation means to encourage or keep on keeping on. That's what they have the gift to do. And then also they have the ability to console when a brother or comfort a brother or sister when we're in a hard time and we don't understand what's going on. Somebody gives you the right words and they say just the right thing that you need in that moment. You see, he's saying, hey, seek the best one. Which one is best? You're going to go in there and you're going to start praying and nobody understands you. God only understands you and you're the only one that's blessed by it. Or do you want to give where you can walk in the church, see a brother and sister down, be able to speak to them and encourage them and lift them up? Which one is going to do the church more good? Try, try, Which one is going to cause the church to be stronger? Are you wanting a gift that blesses the church or are you wanting one that only you get something out of it? Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Here we go. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies or builds up his own self. But he that prophesies edifies or builds up what? The body, the church, everything around him. Notice again, Paul uses the singular tense here. Paul points out that this unknown tongue builds up only the individual that prays in it or speaks in it. While he that utters spirit-filled saying builds up the entire body. Let's jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. But the manifestation or the revelation or the revealing of the Spirit is given to every man to profit what? With all. Everybody. That's there. So which is more desired? A prayer language? Or a heaven-sent, spirit-filled word of God? Spoken to a Christian friend in a deep time of need. Verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues. Now notice this. He's, he's getting into a plural now. But rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues. 
except he interprets and the church may receive edifying. Paul is confessing. He's saying, hey, I wish all of you spoke in a tongue or have been there to witness it and to be a part of it. But I've got a bigger desire for you to speak words with the power of the Holy Spirit on them that will utter and build up the church. You see, the person that prophesies, he builds up and strengthens the whole body. Jump down just a few verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 19. It says, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my own understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. It's going to do the church more. Five words in the English language that are empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit will do better than what did he say? 10,000 words of a prayer language in Yeoman's Chapel Baptist Church. There's just no need for it much. Notice this. It also seems that everyone at Corinth was not speaking in the tongues and their fellowship was not questioned. You said, well, what do you mean? I'm saying this. Some of them weren't speaking in the tongues, but yet they weren't saying you're not a brother or sister in Christ. Paul didn't say, you've not spoken in the tongue, you need to step up. No, he's saying this. If you've not spoken in the tongue, pray that you get the gift of God. But I'm telling you, there's even a better gift than that one. That's right. And y'all put this one on Facebook. That's what he's saying. That's going to completely against the theology that's being taught in our, in our county. And the third thing, note that when he begins to use the word tongues, and notice he begins to use the word tongues in a plural sense, or with an S at the end, it's going to be needed to be accompanied by a translator. Not a heavenly language, but the idea, not the unknown tongue, but the speaking in the tongue is going to need to be accompanied by a translator or an interpreter. We ain't getting to that tonight. Oh, we ain't getting to that tonight. Matter of fact, we'll stop right there. No, let's go on. You want to go on? What y'all want to do? I ain't got five more verses. So let's go on. Now Paul speaks toward the confusion that the tongues can bring. That's what he's going to talk about. The Lord says, He says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? He begins with a question for What is the value and the benefit to the church with me speaking in the tongues? What's it going to help the church? Except, he uses the word except. The word except in the Greek there is in the negative context, like no or none, but then you use it in connection with uh, uh, the other word that's following it, and it also means none unless accompanied by or along with. What good is the speaking in a tongue for the body of the church? None except they have these things, revelation, knowledge, prophesying, and doctrine. The word revelation there means if I speak in the tongues, I'm also, if it wants to benefit the church, then I also need to bring some new revelation. Remember, they didn't have the Bible at this time. So he said, hey, along with the tongues, you want to be blessed? Let me, I, bet I also need to bring a new revelation with you. Oh, or maybe I need to bring knowledge, some new understanding of an old revelation. Or maybe it's prophesying. Words of, uh, words of spirit filled. And then doctrine. Maybe I'm going to come in uh, and, and give new instruction or some new type of teaching on the way the church should be run. But the tongues alone are not going to build the church up. But these other things, these other four that I gave you, revelation, knowledge, prophesying, and doctrine, they're going to benefit the church. You know what? All of those can be given to you by different revelation. God gives revelation to a preacher. God gives knowledge to teachers. Prophesying can come from a brother or sister that's sitting down in the pew and notice that you're in a bad shape today. And they tell you, God just wanted me to call you up or say something like this. Doctrine, man, the Sunday school teachers teach you the best doctrine you'll ever get in your life. Our deacons, they, they're men of doctrine. And these things, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or heart, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is pipe or heart? Everything. 
Sound, the sound that is given identifies the object that makes it. Even if it is an inanimate form, lifeless things are known by the noises they make. If I brought a tuba in here and blowed the tuba, you are going to know before long it was a tuba. But you sure ain't going to, if I come in here with a pair of uh, cymbals and I crash those cymbals together and, and I tell you to turn your back and I'm going to crash these cymbals together, I do not believe there's going to be a person in here that when I crash those cymbals together and I say, what is it? Somebody's going to say, it's a trumpet. <laughs> Why? Because it clearly identifies itself, right? Clearly identifies it. But it's through that. If I don't use that, then you're not going to know what it is. I just say, I've got an instrument. And I don't do it. See, it's by the way we sound. It's by the way an object sounds that it's identified. And, I, and might I add this, the Bible said that we are identified by the words which come out of our mouth. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, verse 8, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? In biblical times, trumpets had different songs for different roles. One, they would if it was time to prepare. And then they would go when it was time to advance. And man, you don't even want to hear the one when it was time to retreat. I can't even do that when it's so fancy. But you see, but they did it with drums in the Civil War. And the pace of the drum, the faster the drum beat, the harder you advance. See, they used the sail to direct the company. God uses the words of a pastor. He uses your words to help direct this church. Oh, that's scary, ain't it, with some of the words I know have been going around this church lately. But, what if the guy that's playing the trumpet doesn't know how to play the trumpet? And all he does is blow a couple of blasts on it. <laughs> are they going to know what to do? No. No. The people around them are going to be ignorant because they don't understand the noise that is coming out. God is not all for confusion. That's in this chapter too. So likewise, ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. In the same sense that they, the, the bugler, the trumpeter, was supposed to clearly blow a specific sound for them to advance or to get prepared, Paul is saying this. When it comes down to the tongues and the confusion of the tongues and all that, he's saying, hey, just like the bugler has to make it clear, so likewise ye, or you in the same fashion, speak with your tongue words that can easily be understood. How shall, if not, how are others supposed to know what you're saying? And I think he throws in a little bit of sarcasm right here. Or are you just talking to the wind? Verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. There are numerous languages in the world, and each of them is distinct. They have their own words, they have their own sounds, they have their own letters and vocal systems. Genesis chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may be understood one that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off the building of the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the languages of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Think about it. There's so many different languages. There's languages that... They don't even have, all they are is syllables. The clicking and, you know, the, the, the languages on our seas that they pop and cluck and all that kind of stuff. And that's just amazing to me. And, and you know, some of them languages we look at and we just hear them say something and we look at each other and we just about want to giggle, won't we? But 
you hear that, and then we'll go home and try to mimic them. I try to, I try to do it when I'm ordering it at them time restaurants, and my wife gets so mad at me when I try to do it. But you ever thought this? That when somebody comes to the South, and they hear us say, let's say they're from South Korea, and they hear us say our words, you know what they do? <laughs> and then their wife gets on with them when they try to mimic the way that I speak. That's right. That's right. You know what I sound like to them? An idiot. I do. And I could be telling them something just as serious as I could be, and I could be telling them how much Jesus loves them, and how great the gospel is, and all that, but you know all they hear? Thanks. 